Hi, everyone. Just a little supplemental material on Lutheran theology. We spent a lot of time with Luther's life last time, and with all the great questions as we've had through our sessions so far, we're just a little behind. So I want to give you some content here on Lutheran theology and kind of the Lutheran legacy, and then we'll have time to jump right into the sacraments this upcoming class. You can also, we can also start with any questions that might surface from what you're gonna hear at this point. So let's just kind of pick up where we left off um, and do some, finish up with Martin Luther and then talk about Lutheran theology. I've got a picture up here of Martin Luther King Sr. Um, along with, of course, the person we know so well, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the great civil rights leader, of course. Well, believe it or not, there's a connection between our Martin Luther and these amazing pastors. When I was a kid, I remember being really embarrassed because I, you know, I, I knew I was a Lutheran and I knew about Martin Luther King Jr., uh, and I just assumed that he was the one we were named after. <laughs> and it's a cool assumption, but it was a little embarrassing when it happened that I didn't know that our Luther was 500 years ago versus the more modern uh, civil rights leader, Dr. King. But anyway, as it turns out, I wasn't so off with that connection because uh, the pastor you see on the one side of your screen um, is Michael King, a great Baptist preacher who visited in the 1930s Germany, mid-30s, I think it was 1934, and was so inspired by the story of Martin Luther as he learned about Luther in Wittenberg and what Luther went through and what he did and standing up to what were oppressive powers of the church in his day, that when he came home, he decided to name his new son, his newly born son, a different name. Well, actually, it's even better than that. He changed his own name to Martin Luther King senior and his little boy is named from Michael King to Martin Luther King Jr. And so there you go. There's the amazing connection between these two great figures in history. And maybe just one little, I can't help but get this little note in there. Just like we talked about last week that people have tried to grab on to Luther and use him to kind of baptize every kind of different movement through history and use him uh, to kind of, you know, champion their cause. And sometimes rightly and sometimes wrongly, um, certainly wrongly in the case of Hitler. Uh, but just as that happened with Martin Luther, like today, if you went to Germany, you wouldn't really hear about Luther as a great reformer of the uh, gospel, getting the gospel back into preaching and the law gospel difference and, and you know, recovering the word in the worship service and getting rid of the indulgent. You probably wouldn't hear as much about that as you would about he's a hero of Germany and creating the German language and bringing education and all of this. It's kind of true from um, Dr. King as well. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, people forget that he was a pastor and rooted deeply in the biblical tradition. Uh, this is seen so um, poignantly and beautifully in his last sermon before he was assassinated as he talked about the promised land and how he might not get there, but he knew God's people would get there. And and it, in what we call eschatology, which is a study of the end, and we see in the New Testament, Paul says, you know, God is going to finish, you know, history. And so because Dr. King was rooted in that story. He was able to engage in the present moment and time very powerfully. So we can't forget that all that Dr. King did was living out the scriptures. Yes, he was influenced by Gandhi and the non-violent you know, violent movement. He was inspired by that, but he found that right out of Jesus. 
and the scriptures um, and his the call to love and not hate, all of that. And so, you know, of course, he's got an amazing legacy, but we don't want to forget about Dr. King's, that he's a pastor and a person of the scriptures, just like Martin Luther was. So, okay, there you go. That's um, a little bit uh, of history and um, a fun little tidbit there. So now let's get uh, back into some Lutheran theology and we'll take Luther's legacy. One of the big conflicts um, that Luther had and that we can talk about the Lutheran Reformation is one of the things Luther brought is what we call the priesthood of all believers. That in Luther's day, there was a huge gap between the priests and the laity, the laity, laos in Greek, um, it's the congregation, the, the average person in the pew, so to speak. And this person down here was of very little value. The real important stuff happened by the priests, was done by the priests, the, the bishops, the cardinals, the popes, etc. That was really the church. And the average person in the pew was of little value. And Luther really disliked that distinction. In fact, he wanted to educate the people in the pews, and he felt the only way to really have a healthy, good gospel preaching church is to have really educated laity in the scriptures. And so he didn't like this radical distinction between pastor and parishioner. Um, now, he didn't say that there wasn't a unique call that pastors have to administer the sacraments and preach the word rightly according to the gospel. So there is a separate call for the priest, but we all have the common call in baptism, and we'll talk more about baptism in a little while, um, that we are all part of a priesthood. And so Luther really elevated the importance of laity. You can even see this in the architecture of the churches of the Reformation, how it wasn't just all about the chancel area where the altarism or the priests do their stuff, but now that separation started to get um, changed a bit. So that's a really important part of the legacy of Luther and the Lutheran Reformation. Scripture alone. Um, bottom line, where's the bottom line is in scripture. So when it comes to what the gospel is, what faith is, Luther believed, and as I do, and as our church does, uh, that scripture, although it's hard to understand in some places, it's a book that spans, you know, thousands and thousands of years, and it's a library of books, like we talked in our la session on the scriptures. But nonetheless, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the basic principles of our faith, it is clear. Um, that's why, by the way, the Bible can be translated into so many languages, because it isn't a matter about getting every detail right. It's getting the main story, the, the gospel out, and it's translatable. So scripture is the bottom line. Now, Luther didn't mean by scripture alone that you throw out church history, um, the great leaders of the church in the past, but he just said they're at a lower spot than the scriptures, whereas the church of his time would even say tradition and accepted, you know, practice of the past is, you know, a bigger authority than the scriptures and, and this type of thing. And that's, uh, that's a huge point. So that led then to grace alone through faith alone. This is uh, a big conflict still to this day, um, to some degree, I guess you could say, with our Catholic brothers and sisters, is they want to use lots of words like cooperate and and whatnot. And we just simply want to say trust, faith in uh, what Jesus did for us is what makes us right. So it's grace alone, none of our work, and through faith alone. Big principle in the Lutheran Reformation. Bottom line, God transacts with us freely. These are um, some really important points. And at the heart of them all is really where is authority in the church? And this is, of course, what got Luther in trouble. He didn't realize it at first. He did certainly by the end of his life, middle of his life and end of his life, that he was really by calling into question the practice of indulgences with what he had read in the New Testament and Romans, he was attacking um, the authority of the Pope versus scripture. And that still to this day is a huge difference between the Roman Catholic Church and Lutherans 
as well as other Protestants. Other Protestants will go further and say all of church history is of no value. It's only the Bible. And Lutherans didn't really do that because there's stuff in the tradition of the church that maybe the, the New Testament doesn't say is bad or wrong that is really helpful. One example is our liturgy, our order of worship. The New Testament doesn't give us an order of worship. So if it, Luther said, if it serves the church, if it serves actually the gospel, then that, that's great. And so we, we celebrate the history of the church. Um, and so anyway, there's lots of other examples, but that's one there. So this is an important quote, of course, from the Augsburg Confession. And um, you'll see the Book of Concord there. Um, after Luther, and we got into this a little bit in our last class, uh, there was a lot of disagreements amongst some of Luther's followers as the movement spreads throughout Europe and into the northern um, Scandinavian countries, you could say. Um, and so a book of Concord was created to kind of draw and unify the Lutheran movement in the various countries that it had gone to. Um, at the center of the Augsburg is of the book of Concord is the Augsburg Confession. If anything makes someone Lutheran, it's the acceptance and celebration of the Augsburg Confession. And I suppose not just lip service, but actually this is um, what we believe is the right explanation of what the scriptures teach us. And in that uh, Augsburg Confession is Article 4, we are ju freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when we believe that we are received into favor and that our sins are forgiven on account of Christ. So you got freely, gift, justified, we're made right before Christ, before God, God is righteous. We are not. That's a problem. But we are righteous, made right for Christ's sake through faith, his faith, our faith, when we believe. So belief and faith are actually the same word in Greek. So when we believe that we are received into favor. So it isn't just I believe in a God or I believe God has this law or whatever. It is that we believe that we are received into God's favor because our sins are forgiven on account of Christ. It's a beautiful telling of what the gospel is, the significance of the gospel as we've talked about in this class. And that is at the core of what it is to be, I guess you could say, a Lutheran Christian. So this is um, something that's probably important for you to know. I'll see if I can minimize me and uh, put up kind of the status. Now, this is absolutely the most broad brushstroke of Christian history, um, but maybe it's helpful for you just to put things into perspective. Before Luther, there was the Roman Catholic Church of the West and the Orthodox Church of the East. If you kind of um, take Italy and go West, that's the West. If you go East, um, that was the Orthodox Church. And that division happened around 1000 AD, and we won't go into all that created that, because we don't have time. But it's out of the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, that Luther comes, and we've heard his story now. But remember, one of the things when it comes to Luther's legacy we want to talk about is that many other people went much further than him. By the way, Lutherans were not called Lutherans at first. They were we were evangelicals, evangelion. Um, very different. Well, I don't know if I want to say very different, but certainly not the same as what is commonly today known as evangelicals, which is more of a conservative political Christian um, take on things. I guess you could say, but but evangelicals. That is people that wanted to get the church back to preaching of the gospel, which that's what the word evangelion means. So there, that's what Luth who Lutherans were, but many other people went a little further than Luther. Um, we've got a guy named Zwingli, who is the forefather of the Reformed Church. Um, 
which you might say is a little bit part of the Presbyterian history. These all things get very complicated. But the big person with Presbyterian history is John Calvin, who was much younger than Luther, but lived during the time of Luther. Um, and a lot of the division between Luther and these gentlemen were over how Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, but then there was also folks that were called Anabaptists because as they did, got what Luther gave them, the scriptures, they didn't see infant baptism in the pages of the New Testament. We'll talk about that when we get to baptism, of course. Um, but what they, um, they also were more separatists when it came to involvement in the world and government. They either, if the government wasn't explicitly Christian, they withdrew and had nothing to do with it. So they either were separatists or they tried to create like a Christian run government, which caused all kinds of problems and um, went much further than Luther. But they did still hold to scripture alone um, like um, like Luther did. But, but they definitely, without Luther, that whole thing wouldn't have probably been able to get started. And then there were uh, others, and Muntzer is the uh, pastor, a person that was a big proponent of this view, and they went even further than Luther, and they said that God spoke directly to um, them and to people, even beyond the scriptures. And we kind of believe that God speaks to us through the scriptures. And yes, of course, we get hunches and we feel a leading by the Holy Spirit, but like a verbal speaking, like where we could say, God told me something. And even though the Bible says this, God told me something, we reject that um, that view. And so the spiritualists um, and Luther had a big conflict. And so one of the things I want you to know is not only was Luther taking jabs from the one side of the Roman Catholic side of things, he was also getting attacked by all these other reformers, Calvin to lesser degree, but certainly Zwingli, and um, there were many others that came at Luther. So he was caught in the middle. Luther did not. Uh, he wanted to reform certain things and, and not create a new church, but he got kicked out, as you heard in his story, and that's what really started the separate movement of uh, the Lutheran or Protestant um, uh, Christianity. Protestant comes from the Diet of Spire or Spear, um, um, and where they were first called protesters. And so, so all of these folks got lumped into the category of Protestants. Now you can see that Luther is in the middle between the Protestants on the one side and the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church on the other. And so I often say Lutherans are a little bit schizophrenic. Are we Protestant? Are we Catholic? We're kind of in the middle. Um, uh, you know, so we're certainly both. And Luther actually, because Catholic means universal church or the whole Christ, i.e. not heretics, not people who are perverting the norm, the true core faith, um, Luther fought to say, I am Catholic, I'm not a heretic. So that's why um, we sometimes talk about ourselves as maybe evangelical Catholics or, um, uh, you know, so we, we right in the middle there. So that's an important just thing for you to think about. Um, we've got another way to look at Lutheran theology here in like two main pillars. And of course, we've talked at length already about the first pillar of justification. Um, the second pillar, though, is again, going back to that priesthood of all believers, Luther taught that Ordinary life is the place of holiness and real Christian devotion. I mean, doing your job well, being a good husband, being a good wife, being a good parent, being a good child, being a good student, um, I love it, that that's the place of loving your neighbor. And we have this vocation to use our spiritual gifts to love neighbor. That's where the uh, another spot where the rubber meets the road. We all have different occupations, but in every occupation, we have the vocation of loving our neighbor. And all those occupations are going to compete for our time and energy, you know, family, work, jobs. But that's a holy endeavor. 
<laughs> and that's another way to kind of look at the two main pillars of the Reformation. So now so we're going to go deeper into the Lutheran perspective and some notes in the choir of Christianity, because obviously Christianity has a lot of different expressions. And I like to think we're one really important note, I'd like to say maybe the base note <laughs> of the Christian faith. But, you know, what is that? What are some real things? And one of the early writings of Luther was called the two kinds of righteousness. And I found this one to be essential to understanding what it means uh, when it comes to Lutheran theology. So remember how we've talked about righteousness and being right before God. And he said, Luther said, the first kind of righteousness is actually alien outside because it's instilled from without and happens to us through the work of the word and sacraments and through the work of Christ. So he'll even call it passive because it's not our doing, but, but is received as a gift. It's like, here it is. And so we, we receive it. Maybe that's the best word to talk about what we do in this whole thing is we receive it. Um, we don't create it. It's Christ's righteousness given to us. Um, and so that's really important. That's one kind of righteousness. So when you hear scripture talk about righteousness, you got to know which one you're talking about. Is it the first kind of righteousness or the other kind? And the other kind is our proper righteousness, as Luther would say, not because we alone work it, but because we work with that first alien righteousness. What we do in response and consistency and consists of love of our neighbor. So yeah, we can talk about us living a righteous life, but that's in response to what God has done for us. And maybe even response isn't the right word. It's what happens naturally out of being made righteous, having Christ die for our sins um, and forgive us that, that we're going to forgive others now. We're going to practice our righteousness. But again, even practice maybe isn't the right word. It's we're going to live. And we're going to love our neighbor. And so there are two kinds of righteousness. And when Jesus is speaking in the Gospels, you got to go, oh, which one he's talking about? Um, I think about the uh, one, the publican who was standing far off from the temple, praying, repenting of his sins and, you know, and and crying out for forgiveness. And then the Pharisee who was up by the temple saying, thank you, God, I'm so good and wonderful. And I hide and I do all these things. And thank you for making me, you know, all of this. And then Jesus says, which one of those went away righteous, just? And of course, Jesus says it was the publican, the tax collector who was repenting of his sin. Now, what kind of righteousness was Jesus talking about there? Well, he was talking about the first kind of righteousness. Um, from the worldly standpoint, you might look at the life of the Pharisee and the tax collector and say, oh, the Pharisee's the righteous one. Do you see the difference there? All right. That's a really important Lutheran note in the choir. Of course, we've talked a lot about law and gospel, but one thing that... Um, uh, a professor, um, Pharrell was his last name, a great scholar of Luther. Um, I remember him doing a lecture on Lutheran paradox and that we're comfortable with paradox. And a paradox, of course, is two things that are true that kind of compete with each other or are opposite of each other, but they're held up at the same time, both as true. Well, law gospel is a kind of paradox, if you will. Um, and But Lutherans also, another important part of our note is we are anthropology. How do we look at human beings now that we're Christian? We're same time saint now. We are saints because we're righteous by Christ, but we're also sinner. That nature doesn't go away. Um, and those two natures battle it out. So how can you be both at the same time? Aren't you either a saint or a sinner? No, we say both. And in Latin, simul justus et peccator. Um, is the phrase that we use. Um, we also believe the finite can carry the infinite, that um, this paradox that the Lord's Supper, which I won't talk more about this because we'll talk about this um, this week in the sacraments, that 
the bread and wine can still be bread and wine, but also the body and blood of Christ can carry to us the infinite. And we'll talk about that. But that's that paradox carries over in lots of other ways. We're going to say that now we are set free in Christ to love and serve our neighbor. And yet, because that old nature exists, we're still bound. We can confess every Sunday that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves and then be freed once again in the absolution because we the, the way we believe. Um, and you say, well, isn't it one or the other? Well, no, we believe it's both. So we're, we're comfortable with paradox. And the other one, which hopefully we can talk to when we get to ethics, is that there are really two realms that we live in simultaneously. Uh, we live in the realm of Jesus's kingdom, the gospel, which Luther called the right-hand kingdom. And yet we also live in the civil world, uh, which Luther called the left-hand kingdom. And there's overlap, but there's different rules and things work differently in those two, but they exist simultaneously. This is one that, for instance, the Anabaptists that we were, I was talking about reject. They, they say, no, we just now live in the gospel world and we have to you know, apply all of that to the civil world. Um, this is why some of the folk Christians from the Anabaptist tradition were pacifists because they couldn't, and they wouldn't go to war because they didn't see that there's two worlds that we operate in. One might be a soldier and have to take a life in a war, a just war, um, you know, but, you know, and Lutherans would say, yeah, that's, you can do that. But, you know, the Anabaptist tradition would say, no, there is no distinction. But see, we, we're, Lutherans are comfortable with two things being true at the same time. So that's more, a more deep, kind of more sophisticated, I guess you could say sophisticated look at some of the Lutheran um, tradition. We're coming down the home stretch here now. I want to give you a definition of what it means, what Lutheran means. And I love this um, definition. It was given to me by, I think it was Bob Geyser, great Lutheran scholar, Luther scholar that um, was teaching at my seminary when I was being trained as a pastor. Um, and I think also then Tim Lull, who was the president of the seminary when I was there, the dean of the seminary while I was there. And I love this short, simple definition of the Lutheran note. A movement within the church for the gospel. So a movement because and within because we're not creating a new church. Luther didn't want a new church. If the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church would have conceded or worked, even worked with him on some of the reforms, Ruth was just casting him out because he wouldn't kowtow to the authority of the Pope. Um, he would, we might still not have a project. I don't know what would have happened, obviously, in God's providence, but we really believe we did not create a new church. If you said, well, when did the Lutheran church start? The Even though it's a trick question, if you said 500 years ago in 1517 when Luther tacked the, you know, or supposedly tacked the, uh, you know, 95 theses on the Wittenberg uh, Castle Church door, you'd technically get it wrong because you'd want to say, well, on Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and they began to preach the gospel and people were cut to the heart and, and believed and were baptized and received the Holy Spirit. That's when the Lutheran Church started because we don't claim a separate history. Uh, so, um, so it's a movement. It's not a separate church within the church, the church universal, the church Catholic, and then obviously for the gospel, as we've talked about it, that Augsburg confession definition in article four um, that we've just heard about. So I love that. So if you even want to memorize, well, what is Lutheran? Well, it's a movement within the church for the gospel. That's what Lutheran is. Um uh, it's kind of fun to tell a little story here. Um, you know, probably the biggest question I always get is how come we have Catholic in the creed? Are we Roman Catholics? Because we confess the Apostles' Creed, um, which is has baptismal roots going way back to the first, second century. 
And um, of course, it doesn't get completed. We'll talk about that later. It doesn't get completed until much later. But in 1978, they reinserted the word Catholic versus Christian. Um, and I kind of already addressed this one uh, a little bit ago. But yes, we're Catholic <laughs> with a small c. Um, and like I say, I talked about that just a minute ago. But I, another way to define the Lutheran movement, uh, the Lutheran note, is a recovery of the word. Uh, I think that's the one that Bob Gazer, my Luther professor, used. And uh, it is a recovery of the word proclaim. Remember how we talked about word, not just scripture, but Jesus and the proclamation of Jesus and um and certainly the Holy Scriptures. So it was a recovery of the word in the life of worship, the life of Christians, the life of the church. Um, here's the last question for our Lutheran theology content. What's our religion? Um, Timothy Lowell, uh, he's passed away now, but he was the dean of the uh, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary where I went to school. Uh, for being trained up to be a pastor, uh, told the story of his confirmation exam. And, you know, I, as you probably are aware, Lutherans traditionally have had this curriculum of the small catechism uh, in seventh and eighth grade, sometimes ninth grade, to you study for a number of years before then you were confirmed in your faith, just like God made a decision for us in baptism that would maybe be um, the, the cementing of God's decision in our life and, and us saying yes, I guess, or confessing the faith as an, as more of an adult, but there's a lot of prep for that. And, and, uh, Dr. Lowell, uh, was telling us the story of his confirmation exam. And he said that his pastor was so serious about this. He said it rivaled anything he uh, faced in graduate school. <laughs> um, I mean, this was some serious, you know, catechism study and theology. And, and so the last question, though, on the exam was, what is your religion? And he said, always, almost everybody got it wrong. And his, his class was no exception, because what did they put? Well, they, of course, put Lutheran. And that's the wrong answer. Um, we are a movement within the church for the gospel. The answer, what is our religion? It is Christian. We are Christians. We are people. Of, if you want to use the, the term from the book of Acts, people of the way, but most people don't know what that is. And I know that a lot of people are trying to get away from this term because they don't like the... PR that certain other Christians have got, and they don't like the association. They don't like to be um, put in the same boat with Christians. Today, people are calling themselves Christ followers, and uh, because they are trying to get away from the negative connotations that have developed around being Christian, which is, in my view, largely uh, propagated by uh, media and our TV and all of that, but I won't go down that uh, that rabbit hole. Um, I like the word Christian. I am a Christian. I'm not just a Christ follower. My whole faith is not in my following of Christ, but it's in what Christ did for me. I'm a Christ believer, and that's what a Christian is. I'm a Christ receiver. We are Christ receivers, and so, you know, we just got to hang in there with the word Christian. We are not you know, Lutheran is an adjective. Uh, it is not, a, it should not be a noun. Um, we have a Lutheran perspective on things coming out of the Reformation, but Christian is our religion. You are a Christian, uh, or I pray you'll become one if you're not already. <laughs> so there you go. There's some content regarding Lutheran theology. I hope this is helpful. Again, we can pick up and ask some more questions about it as we now launch into sacraments. God's peace and grace to you this day. Thanks be to God. Amen.